you'll recall from our previous lecture on uh, South America uh, that we said that uh, the initial exploration and settlement of South America by the Spanish and the Portuguese concentrated on extractive industries. Uh, for the Spanish, the extraction of silver, and for the Portuguese, uh, cane sugar. And that this uh, approach, this extractive approach, marked uh, Latin American history down to the present time. We also said that there were two competing explanations for this phenomenon. Uh, the first was an environmental explanation, which posits that the tropical climate of Central and the northern half of South America uh, is uh, unsuitable for European settlement and agriculture, and as a consequence, did not give rise to the type of entrepreneurship and productive enterprises that one sees in North America. The second explanation is a social and cultural explanation, which posits that the particular social structure of the Iberian Peninsula of Spanish and Portuguese uh, societies uh, favored uh, a landed aristocracy and clerical class that um, uh, was used to uh, pursuing what is called, sometimes been called a rentier economy, which is the dependence on uh, rents and uh, other forms of extraction from labor rather than an entrepreneurial and a commercial uh, uh, approach. Um, and that these are sort of competing explanations for why Latin America relied on these extractive industries and failed to develop a more entrepreneurial and productive uh, economy. Uh, this week, turning to North America uh, and to the uh, question of the coming of the American Civil War, uh, we're going to make an argument in favor of environment or physical geography as the determinative factor. Uh, this argument goes something like this, that in both North and South uh, states of the United States, uh, the, the settlement and development of society uh, was similar. That is to say, initially the immigrants to the what became the 13 colonies and eventually the, the United States came in the 17th and 18th century overwhelmingly uh, from Northern European stock, English, Welsh, Scotch-Irish, and German. And that once that population had been established by the middle of the 18th century, the natural increase of that population accounted for most uh, of the population of both Northern and Southern United States. So. Uh, as we can see, for example, in the founding fathers of the, uh, of the United States, it was their similar cultural and social background that enabled them to collaborate in the formation of a single nation. Uh, by contrast to that, the different physical geographies of the North and South is the determining factor that explains the rise of different economies and therefore different political uh, orientations that eventually led to the American Civil War. To understand this argument, we begin by looking at the physical geography of North America. First of all, the topography. As uh, this map shows, uh, the topography of North America, and particularly the United States, is formed by uh, large mountain ranges in the west and the east, uh, separated by a broad alluvial or uh, central plain. In the west, this is known as the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas, these young, very high, rugged mountains that were formed by the collision between the North American plate and the Pacific plate, as explained in our lecture on plate tectonics. In the east, the much older, more eroded Appalachian Mountains long precede the breakup of Pangaea. Uh, by several hundred million years are, and in fact are associated with a pre-Pangaea breakup uh, that includes uh, the Atlas Mountains of what is now Morocco and uh, northern uh, Africa. Uh, the drainage off of these two eastern and western mountain ranges uh, forms the central uh, Mississippi River system and the alluvial plain that stretches from the western edge of the Appalachians all the way to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. 
The second feature of this physical geography is climate, uh, temperature, and rainfall. Uh, and as this map shows, the bulk of the United States and all of continental United States lies between 30 degrees and 50 degrees north latitude. You recall that along 30 degrees north latitude, we have a prevailing high pressure zone, the so-called subtropical high, which is, produces a persistent dry climate as is seen in Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, and West Texas. Whereas north of the 30, 30th parallel, stretching all the way to the 60th parallel, 60 degrees north latitude, we have, as explained in the lecture on atmospheric physics, a prevailing westerly, global westerly wind pattern. That is to say, the winds come from the west or from the Pacific Ocean and proceed from west to east across uh, the continent of North America and in particular the United States. The interaction between that atmospheric pattern and the topography mentioned earlier produces a discrete rainfall pattern across the United States. Uh, as this topographical map shows, the air loaded with Pacific, uh, with moisture that has been evaporated off the Pacific Ocean, hits the west coast of the United States, rises, cools, the moisture in it condenses, and falls as relatively heavy rainfall along the west coast of, uh, of the United States, in particular the northwest, or what is now the states of Washington and Oregon. As that air mass passes over the Sierra Nevadas and the Rockies, the air rises even higher, gets colder, more moisture condenses and falls as rain and snow on the Rocky Mountains. Passing over the mountains, however, most of the moisture has been wrung dry out of the air and we get is what is called a rain shadow over the central part of the continent uh, forming uh, the Great Plains. Finally, as that air mass reaches the Mississippi uh, River, the Great uh, Lakes, and the uh, water systems of that drainage basin, the air is recharged with moisture, so once again we get rainfall over the eastern half of the United States. So this map of, uh, of precipitation in the United States demonstrates this profile. Note the, the very distinct division between the eastern and western half of the country, with the east being much wetter and the, and the west being much drier. Uh, note also that the very heavy rainfall on the northwest coast and the extremely dry climate in the southwest along California, Arizona, New Mexico, and west Texas. By contrast, in the eastern half of the United States, we get a temperate and moist zone in the northeast quadrant of the country and a wet and warmer zone in the southeast uh, quadrant of the country. Uh, these slides illustrate this, uh, this uh, rainfall and temperature pattern. Seen here first in Seattle, where you get a very uh, persistent, misty, wet uh, climate and then passing over the, the Rocky Mountains into the Central Plain, as indicated here in this slide of Nebraska, a uh, treeless uh, grassland that extends uh, across the center of the country, and then moving up into the, in New England in the Northeast, a moist temperate climate that produces a deciduous and mixed forest, then swinging down to the South, as, as pictured here in Savannah, Georgia, a warmer, wetter climate, and then finally swinging all the way to the southwest, an extremely dry uh, desert. In the next uh, part of this lecture, we will look at the implications of this physical geography for the distribution of agriculture and human settlement uh, in the United States.